Oh, yeah. The, um, what else? The, uh, there we go. Now, this last chapter on nutrition and metabolism, uh, I have a couple of lectures for you. Actually, I, I, I did such a beautiful job. I'm just gonna put those two up there. Um, they worked out just fine. And it's good stuff. Vitamins, minerals, our basic metabolic rate, calories, things, you know, that a lot of you are interested in. So that's your, your, uh, your plan is to finish digestive system studying and then study that last chapter and be ready to take a final the last class. Forward now. All right, guys, let's do it. Let's do it. Um, oh, this last lecture is going to challenge me. Okay, we got it. All right, so, um, the online lecture is pretty long, pretty long, but when I didn't realize it was a long, so I'm talking for over an hour, and I got it for a long time. Right, but, uh, um, you guys heard me the first one, and then uh, continued on, and then this will be a shorter one. We're going to just do a look at the liver, the intestines, what's going on with that, and uh, some digestive issues. This is what fresh liver looks like, and then people will say, you know, what does your liver do? What doesn't it do? What do you see? There's all these great things. It's, it's uh, making your uh, proteins and it's detoxifying the alcohol you consume. It's uh, storing sugar and releasing sugar. If you look at um, like in nutrition, you look at oh, what food would I need to get more? I need to get more vitamin A. It's always liver. No one wants to eat liver. I like liver and onions in small amounts, you know. But uh, liver got all kinds of nutrition because it stores all these vitamins, especially iron. But this is a big organ. It's like the size of a football. It's up in your upper right hand quadrant. I feel the edge of my rib cage. My liver's right, I can't quite feel my liver right there, but the liver's enlarged. You can actually they feel it. Well, how big is the liver? It's a huge organ, huge organ. And you know, when you say it's an A and P, and someone says, What's your largest organ in your body? You say skin. Skin is a two meters square surface area, and all the fat associated with things. The liver is this year, like three and a half pounds. But uh, yeah. Now the liver sits up there, and I guess looking at this picture, we're talking about the functional liver is it gonna take the food and all the nutrients you get you absorb, and they all go through the liver. The liver is this filter that can take care of no matter what you absorb into your body. So imagine you eat a whole bunch of sugar, something like that, and these uh, the arteries. Uh, are going to bring tons of blood to the small intestine to do absorption. The veins don't drain back into your inferior vena cava because who knows what you're absorbing? Tons of sugar. There's also bacteria too. Bacteria get in, and uh, you don't want that going to your bloodstream too. So your liver is going to filter the bacteria, uh, and it's especially going to chemically take care of uh, whatever you consume. So you drink a bunch of alcohol, it gets absorbed. All the blood from the organs of absorption, your small intestine, your large intestine, your stomach, your spleen, too, it all is going to drain into the liver. And your spleen is not for digestion, but your spleen breaks down red blood cells. So those products go into the liver, too. And we're going to see this greenish, bile colored, um, gooey liquid uh, gets its color from breakdown of red blood cells. So it kind of makes sense. The spleen is draining into the liver, and all the organs are even absorbing it. Because you don't want to eat a whole bunch of sugar and have it go right to your brain. So your liver allows you to store that sugar. When it comes out the back of the liver, the paddock veins, it's already been filtered by the liver, and you've taken the blood sugar and brought it way down. Well, the hepatic portal system, any hepatic liver, I'm this, 
And the portal system takes all the blood from uh, your intestines, your stomach, your spleen. It goes into your liver. All right, so it's two, uh, two capillary beds, the absorption and then the liver capillary beds. I'm looking at the anatomy of the liver. If you take a fresh liver, I'll show you that picture. You can buy it in grocery stores and liver. But it's just kind of, uh, it's bright red, like kind of flimsy. It's got this membrane on it, but kind of flimsy. Like, you guys get the picture, kind of like that. It's, but it's, it's going to have blood vessels going through it, and uh, et cetera. But it has a big right lobe and a left lobe. So it's got a big right and, right and left lobe. And underneath it, it has two more lobes. Anatomy is it calls the quadrate lobe because it's square, like a quadrangle. But the quadrate lobe is between the gallbladder and the middle ligament. And then caudate lobe is in the back. Caudate means tail. So it's in the back. Yeah, but the right lobe is biggest by far. It's huge. We have four lobes to the liver. The only thing I should say, you can't live without a liver. You die pretty quickly. You can live with just like 20 or 30 percent of the liver. You can donate a liver to somebody, parts of your liver. Then you know this liver is critical for life. It makes all these proteins and it can take care of your blood, all these things. You see how the gallbladder is stuck underneath it? The gallbladder is going to take the bile that the liver makes and store it. So you split it out and the gallbladder is a bladder just like your urinary bladder. But in this case, it's going to take the bile. Going to store it, but also concentrates it. The gallbladder is going to help form this bile. Picture above, you can see how big the liver is. This thing is huge, huge organ. Protected by those ribs. Often in a cadaver, you think about it, you feel like there's depression about it. And then this region is important. These are these three things that I'm going to get to again. This area is called the porta hepatis, like portal to the liver, porta hepatis. And it has uh, three things. One is the bile duct. So the bile duct is going to take bile down to the intestine, like it's squirt out your food. Right? So it's going out. The two things going into the liver are going to be the big hepatic portal vein, which just drains all of your intestines and your stomach. And then a hepatic artery. So the artery is carrying fresh blood. Because let me tell you this, if you're a liver, you don't just want portal blood, because portal blood just come from the intestines. It's got very little oxygen. Why do you like take it? It's got tons of like sugar in it and stuff from being absorbed, but the liver needs some fresh blood. So you can see it's about 70, 30, the portal blood and then the fresh blood. So there's a hepatic artery that's, that's going to mix with the portal blood. The liver gets into oxygen. All right. And so we're going to see the structure inside the liver, how the blood just percolates and filters through it, gives those liver cells a chance to work on the sugar and the alcohol and everything else. And eventually, so all the blood goes into the liver here by the hepatic portal. The hepatic portal. It's all going to lead by a hepatic vein. Out the back. It's going to be the cave out so far. All right, you got it. All the blood from here, they can absorb and something goes to the liver. Right. Oh, there's ligaments again. It's not gross anatomy. You don't have to for everything. Watch out before those, of course. What goes in there. But on these ligaments, I'm not going to test them on. But this round ligament is kind of interesting. If you look at a, come up in a body, there's a ligament that goes from the liver to your belly button. And it doesn't seem to make much sense. Except that when you were a fetus, you had an umbilical cord and you had uh, a, you had umbilical arteries and veins and the blood coming from mom from the placenta went right through the liver that that ligament used to be a a, a duct and you see a big artery you see a big and open so that's kind of cool as soon as you're born they cut the umbilical cord this what used to carry blood from mom from the placenta you know into the liver let's say a shortcut maybe your vein cava and you're born turns into this ligament Remember in the heart, there was those two vessels that people circulation. Here in the middle, we have this. Thing. All right, so let's look at um, let's look at liver. Now, histology-wise, you normally get a slice of pig liver when you first look at it. And it's got this characteristic, kind of like a kind 
hexagon, something like that, like a stop sign, has a hole in the middle of the eccentric canal. But um, in humans, those, those separations are not that obvious. And so here, I mean, I can kind of squint my eyes and I can kind of see, and I got the septal canal, I can kind of see where it's kind of a hexagon, but in pigs, it has, in other animals, it has this nice kind of wall almost. So that's what liver looks like. You guys know what you call liver cells? What would you call it? How about hepatocytes? Hepatic is liver, hepatitis. Hepatocytes are liver cells. And uh, the hepatocytes there are big active cells. Every day of your life, you guys are eating and drinking. And these liver cells are filtering, you know, they're storing your sugar, storing your iron. They're making all your clotting proteins, they're making your albumin. So, yeah, liver cells, hepatocytes are very active. So, this is the diagram. But I thought histology, or it's even, this is a theory. I mean, it's a, it's a hypothesis. We think it's this kind of a system. So, I'll tell you what it is. But then there's kind of some alternatives. But this is how we think the liver works. There's a central vein in the middle, central vein in the middle. And then we think all the blood comes in through these corners of this stop sign. And then it filters towards that central vein, like a drain in the middle. So in each one of these corners, you're going to have this triangle, these three things that we talked about. A portal vein carrying blood from the guts, a hepatic artery carrying fresh blood from your heart, and then a bile duct kind of on the opposite. Way. So your hepatocytes make bile, and they go through these little caniculi, little canals, and eventually your whole liver, the cells are making bile, it's going to leave the liver and be stored in your gallbladder. That's, that's one part of your liver. The other part is the filtering of the blood. And that's where you have like 70 30 portal blood, which is filled with uh, everything you absorb from your meal. It doesn't have much oxygen, but it's got a hell of a lot of sugar, amino you know, acids, and everything fats. And then it gets fresh blood. Like I said, the liver would die if it just got, it needs more oxygen, you know, so get some blood right from your heart. This blood makes us the portal and the fresh blood, and it percolates down these little channels called sinusoids, those little capillaries that percolate down towards the center. And on the way, this blood gets washed against these cells, these hepatocytes, and it gives them a chance to work on it. Like if it was a direct connection, like a shortcut, that would suck. All of would just goes right through the liver. But this forces the blood to slowly go through these little channels where all the cells can work on it. So they see extra sugar, they store it. Glucose, they store it in glycogen. Too much iron, they're going to store it. Um, they notice you need more clotting factor, they make fibrinogen, they make angiotensinogen, they make all these proteins that you make in your blood. Woo. So we think that the blood comes in at these corners and filters into that central canal. And all the central canals will meet eventually to make the big vein that drains out the back of the liver. What do you guys think? The idea that's the paradigm that happens. If you look at it, it looks like this it has these central uh, veins in the middle, and then you can kind of look at the corners and you see there's those three. There's always three at the corner. So bile is formed and it moves out. Bile is moving out toward the edges of the stop sign. The blood comes from all corners and filters in towards that central vein. Yeah, so you see fresh blood mixed with portal blood. You see kind of mixing. So these liver cells, you get this nice combination, and then the hepatocytes, liver cells, and the bile go in another direction. And then it's going to be zooming along all these little channels in the liver are macrophages. Little macrophages. They're called Cooper cells, Cooper the carrier. They're macrophages, and they're just going to zoom around. They're going to eat bad guts. So. You know, absorption from the intestine, oh my God, the large colon, a bunch of bacteria. So some stuff will get through. And when we make it to the liver, these macrophages can destroy it. So the liver comes out cleaner than it came into the liver. So the liver's going to clean up. 
The liver can also get rid of old red blood cells. He says you can destroy it. So the liver can do a lot. Oh, here's the function. Well, they carry your blood chemistry, really. And there's 20 filters in it. They do a lot of the pathogen, right? But the liver takes all this blood. It can even store blood. Store blood. If you guys like bleed a lot, it can like contract and like give more blood in your system. So it's this huge bloody sponge that all blood is forced to slowly be pushed through. So most importantly is the sugar, is keeping your glucose. So um, it listens to insulin and glycogon that comes from your pancreas, right? So insulin will make your cells take in sugar, right? It'll also make the liver take glucose in your blood. Let's say if your blood sugar is too high, say glucose stores it as glycogen. So when you guys work out, or if you're fasting, you haven't eaten, um, you, you break down that stored glycogen and you put sugar in your blood. And then the opposite, you know, also um, if you have too much sugar, it'll store it. If you guys between meals, it'll break it down. So the liver is really big in keeping your blood sugar right. Store your glycogen, release it as glucose. Excuse me. Converts non-carb to glucose. Oh yeah, so it breaks down amino acids. Um, yep, it breaks down amino acids and uh, can make new amino acids. It's just amazing. And then it's huge in. Um, and fats, and fats. Um, if you have a high cholesterol, the drug called statins, statins that you take, and statins, you wonder how does it lower your blood cholesterol? What tells the liver to take more of it? So the liver is just really central to uh, fat metabolism. Um, it's going to allow you to, it's going to package fats to go out to be stored in your fat cells. And then it's going to take fats from your diet and bring it in. So it's the inward and outward to make these you know, LDLs, HDLs, things like we have a cholesterol fat panel going on your blood. So the liver is a, a chemical machine that can make amino acids, it can transform them, make them into sugar, it can make all these fats. And then it makes all your proteins for your blood, albumins and uh, uh, fibrinogen, I mentioned angiotensinogen. We talked about blood pressure. So it makes all the blood protein. So if you have liver failure, you're not making blood proteins, you're going to have edema. Your body's going to start swelling because you don't have that osmosis. You don't have all those uh, important uh, albumins in your blood. Ooh, look at all this stuff, man. Yeah. So it can make, convert you know, your carbs and proteins into fat. Oh. It's where you make, uh, you take the nitrogenous waste when it breaks down amino acids, puts those nitrogens together to make urea. It makes it in the bloodstream and your kidneys filter it out. It's your liver that made it. Oh, cool. And then, like I said, if you look at uh, nutrition, you want to say, well, how can I get vitamin A? Oh, how can I get a lot of vitamin D? Where can I get B12? Where can I get iron? Eat liver. No one wants to eat liver. I say that. We'll be able to. But maybe some of you like liver. I don't know. I don't, ask. I don't mind liver. But uh, liver has, it stores your iron big time. It takes excess iron in your body. It stores this thing called ferritin, it's the way you store iron. So it holds it in there. The last chapter I talk about vitamin A, important for good vision. Um, if you don't get enough vitamin A, it takes about a year before you see deficiencies because your liver stores so much. So it stores vitamin A and you guys use it. So even if you don't, you don't eat it, like normally you'd be deficient, it takes like a lag time because your liver stores it. And then, um, if you remember early on in blood production, you had your bone marrow make blood cells, and your liver used to. So your liver has the ability to step up and make blood cells, but it especially gets rid of the old ones. Your spleen is the big one, then your bone marrow and your liver, so they're all spongy, and they allow the blood cells to slowly go down these little channels, and it gives your macrophages time to recognize worn out blood cells and destroy them. And of course, famously, uh, alcohol is uh, that is your liver is the organ that's going to start breaking it down into not alcohol. And of course, you can you can you can drink more than your liver can handle, and it starts building up in your bloodstream. But um, that's uh, other toxins too. Your liver helps. You. Damn! How about that? Don't ask what the liver does. Jesus! Let's share your blood chemistry. It makes all your proteins and it can 
It's like a chemical machine. You can make amino acids or break it down and make energy and make fats. So huge, huge, huge important. Any questions? Oh, yeah. I put this here because it's an interesting thing too. If you guys are stuck in the Arctic and um, you manage to kill a polar bear, what can you do that? And beautiful. But um, they knew even from uh, the uh, native people in the 1800s, not and it's in a, even a Navy manual, do not eat polar bear liver. And it's because it's filled with what, too much vitamin A. Um, these guys, also same with seal and walrus liver too, they, uh, they grow so quickly up there. Vitamin A is important in growth too, besides your eyes. And uh, you can get uh, this toxicity. This way is like a, you know, 20 years worth of vitamin A by eating one of these, uh, eating these livers because they concentrate because they have a diet of these fish and seals that have lots of vitamin A and they concentrate. So, this is a little fun fact. Not eat polar bear liver. All right, so some liver problems, right? So uh, you need to know what cirrhosis is. And cirrhosis is a change in healthy liver tissue into fibrous tissue. Yeah. And uh, different kinds of cirrhosis. So what would do this? I mean, alcoholism uh, can, can do this. Can, can, or constant uh, barrage of uh, other drugs. If your liver is constantly overworked like that, it can turn into a uh, Cirrhotic. And it's simply your liver function goes down, 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 and eventually there's not enough liver to perform function of life. Alcoholism is often blamed for cirrhosis, but uh, not necessary. We were talking to a doctor and he said, there are guys that sit at the bar every single day. They get up and go to the bar, their livers are fine. <laughs> and there's others just by genetics that they get fatty liver and cirrhosis. And they, you know, they, they get all it really depends, it's real individuality. Definitely, an alcoholic your liver is going to act. We call it fatty liver, like fat lipids build up in your liver, or cirrhosis. It's irreversible. You take normal liver tissue, make it into scar tissue. And then we try it a lot. But once it takes a critical mass of the liver, then you can't. Uh, you all should know, I think I talked about jaundice before. Jaundice is when you get a yellowish cast to your skin, especially the whites of your eyes. and. Uh, it usually means liver failure because, or you break down too many red blood cells because this pigment is really rubin. Uh, the common breakdown of red blood cells, and um, you normally take that pigment and make bile. Like, I'm getting ahead of myself, but that pigment, Billy Rubin, goes into bile. Now, if your liver is failing, that backs up to the bloodstream and uh, it shows up as a yellow cat. Cancer and transplant. This. this shows liver cancer, these big tumors here. I guess I should. Liver cancer is um, only about, I guess, I, yeah, you can do this stuff, right? Only about 2% of liver cancer is actually primary liver cancer, where the liver it actually begins to grow. Most of it metastasizes from elsewhere because the liver takes blood from all the blood in your body goes to the liver. So if you've got bone cancers like that, those cells can easily take residence in your liver. It's like a sponge and energy stuff. So because most liver cancer came from colon cancer, lung cancer, originally. But again, it's not a good one. Um, you can have a transplant, you can get somebody's piece of their liver, but the list is long, you know, it just takes a long waiting list to get this liver or a friend can. Uh, so liver cancer, it's um, it's up there. It's not good one, but um, there's no good cancer. Um, yeah. Let's talk hepatitis. So hepatitis, I mean, generally if your liver is an issue, it may be because of toxins. Usually hepatitis, I'll talk about ABC, is a uh, viral infection. But hepatitis affects, I mean, how many people in the world? Five hundred million. Living with chronic viral hepatitis. That's a hell of a lot of people in the world. A lot of other places in the world, hepatitis is uh, a big problem with people living with hepatitis. You can be asymptomatic and have hepatitis, but it means your liver is inflamed. And uh, there's acute forms where it comes really quickly and you feel like you have a flu, you're run down. And it's just hepatitis A or something, you usually get over it. 
but you can die of hepatitis C, liver can change. Um, basically, I want you to know type A, hepatitis A is usually you go, um, you eat a lettuce and have it wash. It's fecal material that gets in the water, that gets in your food. So, from water or food. If you travel, you know, some places, Latin America, a lot of the rest of the world, you can uh, get hepatitis A. You get the US too. Test B comes from body fluids and blood. It's a little harder to get that. I remember when I first started working in labs teaching, I got vaccinated from test B. So it's a, I think it's still a two series shot. It's been so long. But hep B, you need uh, more bodily fluid, sex or shared needles, that kind of thing is, is how to get hep B. And it's, hep A is, is the easiest to get. Then hep C is a blood thing. A lot of intravenous drug users, if you share needles, you can spread really quickly. Needles and blood. And there's even a D, even a D, just a little bit. But the famous one, people want to catch that baby, you want to catch, but B and C. Hep C, looking at where it comes from, you can see we don't know, you know, 10% of the cases, but IV drug use, sex, or transfusions, you have to get it from blood, I think that's pretty rare, and healthcare workers. Right, that's X. So it can be asymptomatic, it can be you feel like you have flu, or it can be quick and kill you. So it just depends on the kind and how you get it. They even got a FC they have here. All right, cool. So hepatitis, uh, liver cancer, and cirrhosis. What those are. All right, this bile. So bile is the picture kind of shows it's yellowish greenish, viscous liquid. So you look at a cadaver sometimes, look at it before you dissect it, on the skin there's this green stain on the gallbladder. And so it's actually one of the few things that matches the color in the book. And the gallbladder is green, so it's forest green, dark green. And uh, the bile has these pigments that come from the blood cells that make that. All right, so your liver cells are making bile. They make the bile. So I'm asking the test. You realize the gallbladder just stores it. The gallbladder concentrates it too, it sucks out the water. Uh, but the liver cells make the bile. And they make it by, uh, they take cholesterol, they make these things called bile salts and water. And so it's this thick, and it takes pigments, pigments from the red blood cells. Now the only thing that really does anything is the uh, bile salts. The bile salts are going to help you digest fats. I'll show you that. But the pigments and cholesterol that are excreted, it's just a way to get rid of them. It's just, they don't do anything. It's just, you know, it's sort of the wrong way. All right, so let's see. So you always make it. The gallbladder is going to fill up the bile. If you have it, you guys know you don't have to have a gallbladder. But if you have it, it'll fill up two meals. And then when that intestine is stretched, it gives off, you guys have been studying, hormone CCK, polycystokinin, that is going to. Uh, uh, make you squirt out of the uh, all out of this bile, make that sphincter relax and squirt out of the air. So bile salts, we call them emulsifying fats. They have a huge problem digesting fats because they don't mix in water. So fats make these big globs. You can't, you can't, any more surface area, you can't work out a glob of fat. You need little tiny pieces of fat. And so emulsify is like putting a uh, uh, putting a dishwashing liquid and it helps the fat, breaks up the fat, puts into little pieces and uh, it'll allow you to uh, break down the fat and absorb it. Yep. And the color of it is because of these uh, pigments from red blood cells. And it's a way we get rid of cholesterol too. So there's it, you're going. Interestingly, bare gallbladders have a good marker in Asia. This and all that anything. Um, but gallbladders uh, sit stuck underneath the liver, and um, there's these ducts. These hepatic ducts will take all the bile that the liver makes, and they'll go down this bile duct, getting ready to go into the duodenum, your intestines. But that sphincter is closed. The bile then backs up into your gallbladder, and the gallbladder fills up. The ducts is called the hepatic duct coming from the liver. It's called the cystic duct. Cystic, cystic is the bladder. And then the bile duct, common bile duct. 
So between meals, that gallbladder slowly fills up with bile. If you don't have a gallbladder, it's okay. You just always make a bile. The ducts shook slowly a little bit, but they tell you to look at your diet when you don't eat huge fatty meals. It's extremely stress. But I know people have gallbladder, but I eat anything. Well, the problem with the looks like a kidney stone is also because you're concentrating this liquid, there's a chance for it to precipitate out as these, these crystals. And so gallstones are usually cholesterol. You should know that 80% have cholesterol. So and it's true, like what causes these? Some of it's genetic, and some of it's too much cholesterol in your diet, and obesity can cause these stuff. Uh, but, but most of them are cholesterol that just there's so much in it that it starts making these concretions, these stones. Look at the size of a golf ball. Or they can be tiny. And other ones are pigment stones. I showed you pictures of both. So you have too much of that really rubin, the pigment to make those stones. There's different kinds of stones. And um, and they can cause asymptomatic. You guys can be sitting here in golf stones, you don't even know. It. And it's not a problem for your skin, right? But they can block off the ducts. Then you have tremendous pain. But it passes. Then you go all the way down the wild duct and get stuck just before the intestines. And then, oh my God, it can back up into both your gallbladder and your pancreas. Can back up. That stone gets caught way down at the sphincter just before the intestines. Your pancreas, pancreatitis, because it's they have a common duct. So, right? so um, they can uh, they can get rid of these stones. There's various ways they do it. They can do a laparoscopic surgery. They can remove the whole gallbladder to keep getting stones and they're just fine. But you guys know people that have gallstones. Right? All right, let's see. I'm looking for a break here. Yeah, I'll, okay, I'll finish at the bottom. All right, so uh, I just mentioned CCK. Okay, good, cool. So, like, um, when you study the digestive system, you know there's a couple of hormones you need to know. Secretin and CCK, when the food reaches your intestines, these secretin and CCK are going to make your pancreas and gallbladder squirt their juices so the juices can come out under this food which came out of your stomach. So the intestinal cells, when they get a bunch of fat and protein from your stomach, it's going to cause it to stretch the intestine, it's going to be acidic, it's going to cause those cells to release this hormone, CCK. It goes into the bloodstream, and then when it hits the gallbladder, it makes the gallbladder, your muscles contract. Those muscles in your gallbladder contract, and it'll squeeze the bile out. And there's a sphincter here. It's a hepatopancreatic sphincter that will relax, and each time that food comes down, it'll be squirted with this juice from the pancreas and the gallbladder. The juice will hit that time in your stomach. I don't mean to review here, but your pancreas is going to secrete bicarbonates to neutralize the acid and enzymes. And then the purpose of the bile is going to help emulsify fats. So the fat in your diet is going to be emulsified made into little pieces by the bile. Yeah. That's the deal. When the food is in your stomach, it's simply churn, churn, churn. If you look at my last lecture, I talked about some hormones like gastrin that makes your stomach secrete more acid and stuff. And then once it's done, it's been hours in your stomach, it starts slowly being squirted into your intestine. And when that food hits the intestine, the cells release hormones. CCK, secretin, that's how your pancreas and your bile, your bile duct, your gallbladder, to release, to squirt those out to hit that food coming from your stomach. Oh, here's a bunch of hormones. Yeah. So be prepared. Here you go. So gastric, gastric and stomach, right? So that is always the inhibitors. And then here's CCK and secret and last. Last lecture on time. Let's go again. All right. Last lecture. Nothing great. So again. I told you why fats are such a pain in the ass. Fats are a pain in the ass because they don't, they don't dissolve in water. They tend to want to ball up. So I'm studying lipids really now with their other hydrophobic, right? So the bile salts, they're, uh, they're antipathic molecules. They have a, uh, an end that is hydrophilic and hydrophobic, and just like detergent or soap. That's how soap works. 
When you wash your hands in the, when you use soap, the soap molecules will surround the fat because they've got, one is a water loving and one's a fat loving. So they surround it in little pieces and it washes off of the water. Same thing here. Bile is going to take the fat and put it into little tiny pieces. And those little pieces, those little droplets of fat, lip pieces, and enzymes can break it down so you can absorb those. So people with bile problems, gallbladder problems, liver problems, they often they can't digest fats. And they don't get the fat soluble vitamins. They need DK because you have to get the fat to get the fat soluble vitamins. That's one consequence. Usually people have bile. Oh yeah, I see that up here. I guess I love this. And uh, remember, this bile is squirted out into the small intestine right away. Hit the fat, right? Well, guess what the small intestine does? Absorbs. Where does the blood go from the small intestine? To the liver. So the bile is secreted into the small intestine. Most of it gets reabsorbed and goes back to the liver to be recycled. There's always a small percentage that you so it goes out of your waist. So you lose cholesterol, you lose bile pigments, but a lot of it is recycled. The bile goes into the intestine, it's reabsorbed, had a coral vein back to the liver. If there's always some that's lost, you have to keep it. All right. Yep. And some of you that vomit, like seriously vomit, some bile can come up, you know, even you get intestine. All right. Any bile questions? Any liver questions? What else can go wrong with your liver? Um, cancer, hepatitis, cirrhosis, fatty liver, I talked about a little bit, it gets fatty. Yeah, big organ, you guys can do fine with half a liver, but it gets down to less than 20%. Then, uh, that's the big oh, they have um, artificial livers, like a dialysis machine. They can hook you up to this thing that it's not as good, but it'll. Uh, It'll filter your blood and it'll add proteins. It has like liver cells in it. So they have like a dialysis for your liver. If you're like waiting for a transplant. All right, let's take a four minute break, you guys. And then uh, we'll finish up. Eleven forty-four.
Physiology-wise, uh, where do things get broken down? Some of these hormones, which is probably the complicated part. And then be aware of, of uh, diseases I talked about. Yeah. All right, you guys. So the small intestine. It is in fact the longest part of the intestine, the small diameter. And you can see seven meters old. Doesn't go right into that muscle giant and all that bit, but uh, there's two. Has the surface area of a baseball ball. Okay. Probably the long joint half of tennis court. That's what the surface area line is about. And there's all these little fingers in there that make it come to the surface area because you're absorbing your water and nutrients, your vitamins. By the time the chyme, this like milkshake like fluid, gets through the small intestine, you've taken all the nutrients out of it that you're going to take. Large intestine is pretty much just. Thinking back to water and salt, and just kind of comparing the weights. But that small intestine is where absorption is. So it has three parts. The duodenum is the first part. This is like a full on, it's C shaped, stuck to the back wall. Um, you can see that the pancreas is going to sit in this little nook. The pancreas will sit in this little nook right here, it's going to take it out. And then the duodenum, the pyloric sphincter, is where the connection between the stomach and the intestines. The pyloric sphincter is closed unless it's squirting out just like five or 15 mils of kind, this milkshake acidic fluid that comes from your stomach. It's going to hit that small intestine. You guys know what happens. And then you, if you do a dissection, this little nubbin, you'll see this little sphincter in there. That's where it's going to be squirted with bile and pancreatic juice, this food that's coming in. Right as it begins journey. The other two parts are called jejun and the ileum. And honestly, gross anatomy wise, you can't really tell where one starts and where it ends. There's clues like how far the fat goes in the mesentery. It gets smaller as you go down, the ileum, the diameter. So if you swallowed something, often the end of the ileum is where it gets caught, like a bug or something like that. You know, it gets smaller as you go down. And then uh, there's more bacteria towards the end. So there's, there's subtle differences, but. Um, just know it's the first two fifths and three fifths. Jejun, oh yeah, jejun is a that may come up, comes up in my like word of the day, you know. So you can feel jejun if you feel kind of empty, kind of lost and sad. It means because uh, in death when they dissect it, usually the, the, the food gets squirted out. Jejun is a term in English language. Uh, ilium means twisted. Do I know? Yes, it was me. It has too many fingers. I shouldn't say that for him, it's just very long. Look at the inside of the small intestine. I said it looks like velvet. I talked about that in my, my online lecture. It looks like velvet. You can put your hands out. Usually, a little greenish food in there, whatever, but it's velvety. And that's all those little villa, those little fingers that come up that increase that surface area to 600 freaking square meters. So yeah, your food and water get a lot of contact against the wall, and it's lined with these columnar cells that are absorbing nutrients, actively pumping in sugars, you know, making enzymes to break down everything. And again, it's review I talked about it in the earlier lecture, but uh, this all had these holes. You can see the naked eye, and then you got the villi, these little fingers. You can give it kind of like that velvety appearance. And as I mentioned in my lecture, you try to dry yourself with a nice plush towel versus a sheet. The sheet can't hold that much water, right? It gets really wet. But little fingers give you more surface area for absorption of water. So. And then microvilli are microscopic on the villi. So this is what gives you the 600 square meters of surface area. It's uh, big folds, villi, and microvilli on the cells. And indeed, this uh, the food at this point is like I say, it's like a milkshake, a slurry kind of a frozen coffee, if you will. <laughs> uh, but just kind of going through, and it's uh, it's filled with all everything that these uh, enzymes are breaking down, it's just breaking down all the carbs and proteins and fats, and you can only absorb the basic, smallest little parts. So you can only absorb amino acids, not proteins. 
or absorb simple sugars, not even disaccharides or charged sugar. And uh, DNA is broken down to nucleotides. And uh, fats are broken down into little fatty acids and glycerol. So everything's broken down to basic parts. Then it can be taken in by these cells lined in your gut. And then they have a chance to do something that they want, but usually it just goes across it, it's just released, and it's picked up by these blood pathways, which will go to your liver. So your liver is going to be. After a meal, it's going to be the, the hepatic portal is going to be a wash in, in, in glucose and amino acids and fats. So, like I said, the duodenum, you can already tell, is the spiritual part. But then it's jejunum and ilium. Ilium is at the end, jejunum is at the beginning. But there's somewhere in the middle of this. And then this fluid that's in the small intestine eventually is going to squirt into your large intestine. Last lecture is about ileocecal valve. The cecum is that sac of the large intestine, and the ileum is where it goes into it. So you want the fluid to go one way throughout the small intestine. So there's a valve right here. Yep, and it comes right here, filled with nutrients. By the time it's at the end, of the colors, it's been you take what you want to die. Use a radiograph. Little kid tells you, Where's my stomach? They point to your intestines, really. Stomach is up under your ribs. Yes. Yeah, this is looking at gross anatomy. You cut open the body fresh, you would see this great momentum and this medicinary fat that lays over the intestines, introduced in the last lecture. And it stores fat. And it also kind of, if there's an infection, it can kind of localize it, it kind of sticks to it. All right, so. Looking at um, one villi, you can see, I want you to know lots of blood vessels are absorbing all of the sugars and amino acids and water and everything like that. And then remember, fats. If I ask you in the test, how do fats get absorbed? Know that it's different. The fats go into the lymphatics called lacteals. A lacteal is a lymphatic vessel in every one of your villi. And fats take a different route. Water is back to mix. Bile, then you need a special system. Oh, and because these cells, the inside of your small intestine, they're just awash with, uh, with enzymes. They're, being, they're constantly refreshed. Every week, these cells die because you digest them. And it makes a bulk of the feces, a quarter of it, is just these dead cells from your own intestine. So you're always making new cells. Yeah, just the harsh part. Your stomach and your intestines. Always just like your skin, always making cells. Here's a view of an intestinal cell. Just know they're really busy. Oh, microvilli, lots of surface area. All right, so I talked about the pancreas in the last lecture, about everything that it made, all the enzymes. Now, the small intestine, what comes out of it, first of all, um, there's a lot of mucus. Your whole intestinal tract needs a lot of mucus. It keeps things moving along. So that then is an inhibit. So once food is reaching your small intestine, it's like, dude, stomach, relax now, right? Your, your gut churning. This medicine will come up and it will inhibit this. These next two you need to just memorize. CCK and secretin. Secretin only goes to the pancreas. As soon as that acid chyme hits your small intestine, secretin is released by the intestinal cells. We're like, damn, it's acidic. Goes in the bloodstream and when it hits the pancreas, it makes it secrete all these uh, fluids and neutralize the acid. All right, and CCK is released also at the same time by other cells. And that's going to make your pancreas secrete enzymes and your gallbladder squirt out bile. So when the food hits your small intestine, secretin and CCK hormones. A lot of your bloodstream that cause your pancreas and gallbladder to squirt out the products. All right. Um, when I talk about where digestion takes place chemically, your mouth you break down starches with amylase. Your stomach is mostly proteins with pepsin. Your pancreas secretes all these enzymes, trypsin, lipases, everything, all kinds of stuff. Now your intestine itself also makes enzymes that are on the surface of the intestine. Um, from my last lecture, enterokinase 
is what is going to secrete by the intestine that makes the same carcinogen and converts it into the nasty trypsin to break down proteins. Trypkinase is made to convert carcinogen to trypsin and break down lipases break down lipids. Hectidases break down peptides. Yeah. And then, of course, sucrase, lactase, these are breaking down disaccharides, sugars. So, sure, a lot of enzymes come from your pancreas, but then your intestine makes a lot of enzymes. Break down everything you eat. And people that are lactose intolerant don't make enough lactose. Um, I, it's a long story. No, I can't talk about it. Anyway, but I mean, we think humans shouldn't be able to digest milk as adults. But there was early on an evolutionary mutation that people who were keeping animals, they'd be able to eat milk, they had to be able to have more babies. So now a lot of people in the world that cannot digest milk products, but uh, a lot of Northern European descent can drink a lot of milk and cheese later in life because uh, somehow it retains baby characteristics of original milk. Because we're weird mammals. What a mammal drinks milk as an adult. It's a baby, right? But we do, and so anyway. anyway, lactase intolerance is usually a problem with lactase. You can't break down milk sugars. And, Gas. Cool. So, what causes these secretions? Let's see. So, obviously, a lot of mucus is going to protect it. You move things along. Uh, and then uh, these hormones, there's like reflexes. And then, if I ask you what would make your intestines work harder, you say, oh, parasympathetic nervous system, the vagus nerve. That is digestion. What's going to make your intestines slow up? Sympathetic, fight or flight. So just know for sure, adrenaline, fight or flight, is going to slow down the You don't want to exercise that you So parasympathetic is going to make you, your gut move, it's going to make the secretions. Major digestive enzymes. Sounds like a good question. Where it begins is in the saliva. It's amylase that breaks down starches. You definitely got to know your stomach is pepsin based on proteins. Pancreas has a huge list. Pancreas, the secretions, the pancreatic juice, break down everything. And then your intestine itself, things like that. These are where the enzymes come from to break down your food. Physically, your teeth, your stomach churn it, but these chemically, these enzymes break it down so they can be absorbed by your small intestine. Any questions? This up on your refrigerator, set it over the weekend. Right, I'll ask a few questions, but obviously not gonna go a lot of this, but uh, yeah. 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 all right. So absorption, how does it take place? Fats are like fats are a thing, but otherwise, sugars and acids they get either actively pumped or facilitatedly brought in. Water, just like in the kidneys, water is always pulled by osmosis. Water is followed by salt. Yeah, a lot of drugs for like constipation and things like that, they will keep things that aren't absorbed, like aluminum and stuff, in the water in your in your chyme. And that way, osmosis can't suck the water back out. Things move along. So. Uh, Proteins are broken down. Sugars have to be monosaccharides, the simplest ones that are absorbed. Here, I'm going to I'm slide on fat and how you get absorbed fats. You're going to see. When you break them down, then you need to make them these little like uh, M&Ms that have coating on it. And then water usually is just out of process. So this is what these enzymes do. Lipases. Take this triglyceride and you break it down into uh, to, uh, the fatty acids and glycerol. This is a glycolysis reaction for you guys pay attention to uh, things you want. And then you can see uh, you break the sugar by it. So everything is broken down by hydrolysis into these parts, so these individual parts of what you absorb. You can't absorb a protein or a fat or one compound sugar. So have you broken down those parts? All right, so let's talk about fats. So you need bile to emulsify the fat. Otherwise, you're going to see chunks of fat that go right through. So bile is like a detergent that's going to make the fats into little tiny pieces. And then lipases can break it down into those triglycerides, those uh, 
fatty acids and glycerols. You break it down to main little parts. Then they're absorbed by the intestinal cells as those simple parts are brought in. Then normally once they get in the cell, believe it or not, the cell puts it back together into triglyceride, and then it coats it, puts a coat of proteins on it. That allows it to dissolve in your blood. Because fats can't dissolve in your plasma because fat and water don't mix. So you make these little things, they're called pyromicrons. Pyromicrons are little particles that have a fatty center, and then they have um, a protein coat, and the protein can dissolve in the water. That's the way that it, it gets into our lipids for our bloodstream. Pretty cool, huh? You break down the fats into the parts, then they can be brought to the cell. You put it together, then put proteins in this coat so they can dissolve in the water. The cell kicks them out, they get taken into the lymphatic vessels, which eventually come back to the blood. Full blood will spill it. All right, there you go. Oh my gosh, you guys. All right, we're down at the end here, the large intestine. Um, somewhat synonymous with colon, although. The well, lining nesting in the colon, then they also have like the anal canal, the CPM puncture. But um, this is a, you can see that this is a good uh, illustration of it. Everyone's a little different because I think it's cadavers and people are short. Sometimes they think they're short. Uh, this transverse part is usually like hanging down. The rest of the up and down part is usually stuck to the back wall. They're kind of stuck in these two corners here. Well, the hepatic flexure is my liver, splenic flexure is my spleen. But yeah, it's your large intestine. And the food is going to reach it, the food, the con. By then, you take it on all the nutrients. It's going to be this liquid, plus all the waste, plus the stuff you don't want to take, you don't want to absorb. It's going to hit the colon, slowly make its way down, and you're going to have tons of bacteria living there. You're going to be able to digest like the cellulose and stuff that we can't digest, or bacteria can. There's a couple of vitamins, vitamin K, they are. So, um, I think I'm going to talk about the anatomy. I'll talk about the anatomy first. Uh, so this is the this is the whole thing is your large intestine. So the ileum comes into it. This is this ileocecal valve that keeps food going this way, not going that way. The cecum is this dead end pouch where it begins. And off the cecum comes your appendix, your vermiform appendage, your like appendix. It's just a dead end. And I talked about about appendicitis. You don't need to do Then we talk about this being the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon. And then when it gets down to your pelvis, it has an S shape, sigmoid, sigmoid S shape. And then rectum means straight, like rectus abdominis, rectus femoris. Rectum is a straight little part. The anal canal is the last inch or two for the outside. So that's the anatomy of it, the you know, gross anatomy. And if you notice, it looks like really pouchy, doesn't it? It has like these racing stripes. And it looks pouchy, so it looks different, doesn't it? <laughs> Turns out that longitudinal muscle on the outside, instead of being all the way around, it's just in these few stripes. And then it makes these pouches, which is kind of weird. But the food here slowly moves along. The small intestine has more uh, movements, a little different. It has more often mixing. It has more uh, movements, pushing it down. The large intestine has what you call these mass movements, where there is some mixing back and forth, but then a few times a day it kind of moves everything to the end. Right? How about that? Uh, there's fat that comes off of it, these little fat pouches. Uh, so the colon, what it's doing is going to reabsorb all that water. It comes in from the small intestine like a milkshake, and it leaves its feces. Which is like 75% water, but it's not like 90% water. So you take back the water, you take back the sodium electrolytes. And then um, it's you get rid of everything you couldn't digest. Like we don't make cellulose, you can't break down cellulose. But the bacteria living in your colon can. So they actually bacteria in the colon give us um, some nutrients. I don't know if this is drug smuggling. As an x ray, you can see a lot of little bodies in the intestines. All right. Large intestine, mucus cells everywhere. So, because by then, you don't have any villi, there's no like holes, like 
like that. And you're just kind of moving stuff along. You got a lot of bacteria living in there. So tons of moving stuff. Yeah, so um, no digestive enzymes per se. So when we're done with that business, um, you're absorbing, like I said, it's back to water. So you make liters of spin, liters of gastric juice, liters of intestinal juice, and your juice. All that water you can't lose, so it's wasted back. And it houses a just a tremendous amount of bacteria. I'll, I'll finish the lecture with that. Part of that. And then feces are the waste. So you just got to prepare what you want to go on. And now defecation, I did urination. This is uh, uh, the other waste. Um, what happens is that um, you see you have these mass movements. Is that called? Mass movements, yes. Where all of a sudden the large intestine just starts going from one end to the other. It's moving everywhere. Now when that waste hits the rectum, it's going to stretch it. And it's going to tell you, dude, I got to go to the bathroom. And do it yes, it's going to stretch it like that, and it's going to tell your body it's, it's, uh, that you have feces there. Now, um, you control this external sphincter. I did that in the last lecture. But the internal sphincter, smooth muscle, that's just going to want to stretch. And it tells your reflexes down to the spinal cord, which your brain aware of it, that you have feces ready to go. But your external anal sphincter is skeletal muscle. You control it. When you want to do this defecation, it's like a reflex. Um, you know, relax that sphincter. There's even like kind of a sharp angle here. There's a muscle that kind of like straightens that angle and make it come out easier. So kind of holding this little tight and then it's being held by a sphincter. And then um, when that relaxes, the PCs come out. Once you gain control. Yeah, I'll leave this for you to you can, you can pretty much on your own. I don't have to do it here. Um, all right, so what is the purpose of fiber? You know, fiber, when you're older, you, you know, not, not you know, older than me, obviously, uh, you can kind of easily take fiber to keep yourself regular. And uh, fiber keeps things moving. And um, the bulk of it makes, makes uh, the feces move along. And we think also it helps by being regular like that, helps clean out the body. And it also is a way we, it's going to bind the cholesterol, right? Things like that. Yeah. And uh, so fiber keeps things regular, keeps things moving, and takes cholesterol out with it. And that fiber is indigestible to us. So it's, it's not that we can't digest. Feces. I put a picture of a kitten because I didn't want to you know, do anything else, uh, make it more realistic. But indeed, uh, our digestive waste, of course, is, is a lot of it's our uh, cells from our intestines. Uh, why is that bacteria? So bacteria live in our colon by like billions and trillions, and then they're always got rid of too. Like, there's so many of them that they divide so rapidly, they always keep much of them. The color comes from bile pigments. So remember the bile, get rid of that, remember really rude and stuff. Some of that's gonna make it through. Bacteria to work on can change the color of that. Often if you have liver disease, you have pale feces because changes in that. Liver secreting the bile. Um, mucus brings it along, but it's going to be the indigestible stuff the fiber and bacteria and skin cells that move it through. All right, well, if you talk about this couple, there's this is uh, Crohn's disease, it's a type of inflammatory bowel disease. Now, there is an irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, which is different. This is this disease is a little more serious on the scale. And there's many like flavors of inflammatory bowel disease. But Crohn's is one, and we don't completely understand it. But it's the cause of this. Some of it is some of it's genetic. Um, but what happens is that we think we, what happens is you get inflamed intestinal walls, and the villi get destroyed. And also there's gluten. People that can't digest gluten protein and wheat will also get rid of those villi and smooth it out. You don't digest well. The Crohn's disease, you often see this like cobblestone pattern where you have patches of dead um, intestine. It can be large intestine, it can go up into the small intestine. People have it in different places. And it's possible that it's a, I think it's a uh, autoimmune disease where you attack your own wall of the, the intestines. So possibly you had a viral or bacterial infection, you made antibodies against it. 
but it's so similar to some of these intestinal cells that attack to them. So there's really no cure for this. Um, and people will, will lose weight, it'll be very painful, and you know, it can really affect your life, of course. But um, so there's many kinds of bunch of bowel disease. You can have ulcerative colitis where holes form in your colon too. I would say bleeding allergies can have issues here too. All right, so if we turn to cancer, let's see, four, four, five, the second data comes in. Okay, so colon cancer. Now, uh, you can see early on, it can be very slow growing. It's not going to be a problem. But when it reaches a stage where it bursts through the wall of the colon, then it can spread. It can metastasize to your liver, to your lung. And remember, the blood goes from your colon to your liver, right? So any cells that come off can get stuck in the liver and get liver cancer. So that's why it's important to have um, um, screening for this, colonoscopy. The colonoscopy, um, they say when you reach age 50, it's very pleasant. You drink this big gallon of this most horrific tasting stuff you've ever tasted. Because you work at a pharmacy, what's it called? Anyway, it's just stuff that you're prescribed, then it makes you just go into the bathroom like crazy. So it cleans things out so they can stick a scope up there the next day. And uh, the scope goes up there, and then um, if they find any polyps or, or cancer, they, they have the tools to immediately remove it right there. So they go in, it's, it's not only looking for it, then they'll remove it if they see anything. And if they don't see anything, then you're, you're fine, they'll do it in the next, next 10, 10 years or something like that. But these polyps are where the cancer is growing out. Some of the symptoms might be uh, blood in the feces or constipation because it can actually push in your colon and kind of block it off. But there's other ways. We think colonoscopies might be a thing of the past because they can do a, uh, just test your fecal material to see if it has any cancerous cells, or they can do virtual ones. You guys see in the book, you can swallow a camera and it goes all the way through your body and it just sends out signals to a computer. And they'll be like, get a view all the way in there. So there's there's other ideas, but we still do colonoscopies uh, where you actually look into the camera. You can see if you have colon cancer, you let it spread, you don't get tested, then it can turn into bone cancer or something else. Oh, up there, breast, breast, breast. Okay, so lastly, just have to look at us. So we have a gut that is a uh, teeth that make us omnivorous. We, we eat meat and uh, plant material. Although some of you in this room just eat plant material. I don't think there's any pure carnivores, I don't know. Uh, but uh, the deal with eating a uh, pure uh, herbivore is that you need a huge gut. The plant material is so lacking in nutrients compared to meat. Meat is packed full of proteins and amino acids, right? If you're eating grass, you gotta eat a hell of a lot of grass in order to get enough nutrients. And honestly, we can't even break down grass because we don't, can't break down cellulose. So it's the bacteria in a cow's stomach, a deer's stomach, that allow you to get any nutrients at all. So you can see a carnivore's gut is short. An herbivore gut is huge because you gotta make the plants go really slow to be fermented. And so we have in our, in our, in our guts, symbiotic bacteria. In our colon mostly, but also the last part of our small intestine. And they allow us to digest things that we can't digest. And why no vertebrates can digest cellulose is weird because it's so prevalent, all the plants. We can't digest cellulose. And so in a cow, they have a huge stomach, four-chambered stomach, and it's like a huge vat where it's filled with bacteria and water. And they always throw up their food and chew it and swallow it again. And so I remember going to a veterinary um, Show and they have this fistula, just like I mentioned in the lecture of uh, human energy. And you can look in there, you can see this vat, or it smells like glass and warm. And every time the cow breathes, like some air comes out. And uh, this is a huge stomach where they, they digest the, the grass, and then they, once in a while it washes back and they can absorb the bacterial nutrient back to it. And just so you know, horses are the complete opposite. They have a normal stomach, they have a huge colon. And so the their grass builds up in their colon, their cecum is huge, and then that is allowed to uh, ferment the bacteria there. It's a little issue because you don't usually absorb in your small, large intestine, but they do. Uh, so that's the difference. It's a high gut fermenter, is in the uh, uh, horses, our things, and a uh, poor gut, it has a huge stomach. So if you eat just plants, 
that provides a lot of adaptation. If you eat meat, it has all the amino acids you need. Lots of nutrients for the power. All right, my last little bit here uh, is uh, this idea of, uh, just so you guys can know, this is cutting edge stuff by David Grimm, who teaches nutrition and stuff. He's really big into this, is looking at the bacterial flora in our large intestine. And so you can see how it changes. So before you were born, you don't have any bacteria in your gut. It came from these cells. You have, you have no like outside world um, experience. But as soon as you're born, mom's breast, the, 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 you can put your hands in your mouth, bacteria get in your gut and they start taking up residence. So there's all this research looking how important our gut bacteria is to our health, even our psychology. Right? As a brain, your gut has more, um, makes more serotonin than your brain. It's like this amazing, it's the newest research, some of you guys know about it, but it's so cool. They have these research projects where they have parents send in dirty diapers and they look at how bacteria changes as the infant grows up. They do fecal transplants where they, uh, an unhealthy person that can get bacteria from a healthy person, it helps. Well, that's what probiotics are because the probiotics are eating bacteria to help your gut bacteria. They help seed it with the good stuff so the bad ones don't take over. So, pretty fascinating stuff here. Uh, this, uh, it's a huge uh, line of now we can do it better because we can identify the bacteria easier with DNA sequencing before it had a more big pain in the ass. And so, we're seeing how important our gut bacteria are. Why it's important to help and your mood. So, anyway, I just want to make sure you guys are aware of that. Now, I put this up in your book just so you can see where digestion takes place. Uh, the enzymes. But I just that up there. All right, what about lifespan? Last, last lecture, last uh, slide. Um, as you get older, the main thing is your teeth. I mean, um, you know, old people lose their teeth, and the teeth, the enamel gets thin from drinking acidic soda your whole life and is wearing out. Then the teeth fall out and then that affects their diet. Obviously today we have dentures. But you can imagine the old days if your teeth fell out, you would die. You can't chew the food that came out of eating, right? So um, teeth often cause changes in diet in old people. They also have their taste goes down, so maybe they lose interest in feeding and they get thinner, you know, they can, things like that can happen. Um, constipation, yeah, they have more, more issues of nutrient absorption, definitely. Uh, the cuts at 100 years old, it's gonna, it's gonna age out. But pretty much your liver and pancreas are so big that that's not gonna be an issue. You know, heart disease, lung disease, but you know, you've got so much liver in that, unless there's cancer or something like that, it's just fine. But really a, a tooth kind of thing, uh, more heart. That's it, you guys, you've heard me in person. For the last time, maybe for a lot of you. All right, good luck. Any questions? Email me.